Welcome to Film and Page. I'm Dominic. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about the book, The Mists of Avalon. So this is a book that I just recently finished, and it took me a while to read it. It is uh, quite lengthy, but it was a book that I really liked, I really enjoyed, and so I wanted to do a video and talk about it. So first of all, I'm going to take a close look at the book itself before I get into uh, about the plot and what I liked and didn't like and things like that. So as you can see, just from uh, looking at it here in this close up, the book is rather thick and the cover art I want to talk about is actually really nice. It has actually pretty good cover art. And there's a spine and this is almost like a trade edition. It's not, it's bigger than a paperback and there is the back of the book. So yeah, actually really nice. And it lays open well. And it's got a pretty good font, easy to read. But as you can see, like there is a lot, it's like densely written, like there's a lot on each page, like a lot of text. So that is a close up look at the book itself. And uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about my background with the Mists of Avalon. So this is a book that uh, I've kind of known about and kind of didn't know about. It's, it's the title of it. Uh, it's uh, come across. I've come across it a few times here and there, and I was never sure if it was just a movie or a book. And I didn't really know what it was about. I didn't know it was about uh, King Arthur or anything like that. And uh, a few years back, I kind of got this uh, interest in um, the Legend of King Arthur, and that kind of got uh, started with uh, the 80s uh, movie, John Bor I think it's John Borman's uh, Excalibur. Uh, I've seen that movie quite a few times. And uh, the last few years, I've been kind of getting this craving to read some uh, books based on the legend of King Arthur. And I didn't really know where to start. Uh, but every time I looked up like uh, books that you should start with, then this one would always pop up, The Mists of Avalon. And uh, it, it had really good reviews and then I heard from some people that have read the book that it is really good and uh, what was interesting it was the legend of King Arthur but told from all the females side of the story so it's the female perspective on the legend of King Arthur so I thought that was interesting so I decided to give the book a read and I have to say I really enjoyed this book it was uh, really well done it's very uh, beautifully written and uh, it's the, the story is very interesting and uh, it's I think if you're going to get into stories that deal with the legend of King Arthur this would be a good place to start um, and as far as fantasy like sword and sorcery books go things like that I would have to say that this book would probably be in my top five fantasy books that's how much I like this story so now I'll give a quick uh, summary of the plot. So the plot of the book is uh, the, the, the island of Avalon and uh, all the priestesses and druids on there, their time is starting to fade away. So uh, the whole, all the pagan religions, they're starting to get overtaken by Christianity. So Christianity is becoming more and more the dominant religion and the dominant force in Great Britain. And uh, so as that happens, uh, the world of Avalon, that mystical world and the world of man, they start to separate. They start to, you know, literally Avalon is like drifting, disappearing into the mists. And it's power that it had over mankind is, and over humanity is starting to get weaker and they're starting to disappear. So the, the priestess of Avalon, they're trying to stop this from happening. And so one of the ways they do that is they put someone on the throne who's going to be loyal to the old pagan religions, but also uh, loyal to the Christians as well, because they want a king that's going to reign uh, peacefully in the land. So they, behind the scenes, they kind of work towards getting Arthur put on the throne. And uh, so when that happens, he obeys both, the, he recognizes both the pagan beliefs and the Christian beliefs. And while this is going on, uh, their lands are getting invaded by the Saxons. Uh, so uh, King Arthur, he becomes the great king and he unites all the kingdoms and he defeats the Saxons 
and he drives them back. So then there's peace of the land. But then what happens is uh, Arthur gets married to Guinevere. Uh, in the book, she's called Guinevere. It's uh, spelled a little bit differently. But uh, they get married, and she's a very pious Christian woman. So she starts working on Arthur behind the scenes, uh, getting him to basically disavow or drop the old pagan beliefs because she thinks it's the work of the devil. And as time goes on, Arthur starts to listen to her. So then this is uh, very troublesome to uh, the island of Avalon because Arthur's not, uh, he's not listening, he's not obeying his oath. He swore that he would uphold both pagan and Christian religions, but now he's going full Christian. And now even more and more, the pagan rituals, the pagan beliefs, they're starting to fade away from the lands. So King Arthur's uh, sister in this book, uh, Morgane, she's the focal character. She's like the main character of the story. The story uh, pretty much revolves around her. She's doing everything in her power to stop this from happening. And what's interesting is uh, all the characters' motivations in this book they're, they're coming from a place that where they think what they're doing is right, but then they end up doing some very bad things that's not very good. <laughs> and and uh, But it's all somehow justified through their beliefs that uh, their religion has to survive. And so that's basically the whole plot. That's the whole, I guess, gist of the story. And the story takes off from there. And, uh, but it is a very interesting, uh, dilemma and it's a very interesting, um, I guess, uh, story because you see this happening all the time with different belief systems. You know, you see one ideology start to rise up and start to smother or take out or spread, a, uh, and push out an old ideology. And then you have that, uh, the old idea, people of, that are believe in the old ideology fighting back and trying to. Uh, make sure that what they believe and what they think of right doesn't disappear uh, because they both sides believe that's going to be bad for humanity in the long run that their ideology what they believe is the best for mankind and whether it's an old ideology or new ideology uh, it has to go because if they if the other side wins then it's going to be bad for mankind so that's what's interesting about this book and even though it's paganism versus Christianity. You can see this happening today with uh, political ideologies, how you have new political ideologies that have been rising up over the last few decades and starting to push out old ones, and the old ones are fighting back. So this kind of a struggle, this is just like an ongoing thing, whether it's political ideologies or religions or anything like that. And uh, this book does a really fantastic job of uh, illustrating that in the story. And uh, what I liked about it is a lot of the female characters and the, the priests of Avalon reminded me a lot of the Bene Gesserit from Frank Herbert's Dune. So similar to Frank Herbert's Dune, where you have the Bene Gesserit in the background, you know, they're in all these positions of power, they're married to all these, uh, you know, powerful political figures. And so in behind the scenes, they're manipulating things and they're moving things around. Well, it, this is very similar to the mists of Avalon. All the women in the story, they're all married to kings, they're all married to powerful knights and things like that. And they're all kind of like working in the background, um, whether it's either manipulating their husbands or, uh, you know, uh, even involved in some type of like chosen breeding programs or uh, having put in, getting put in political marriages and things like that. It's very similar to the Bene Gesserit. But the other thing I noticed about this book is uh, the characters are all kind of like enslaved to their ideologies. Like everything Morgane does, she does it for her pagan beliefs. And she never had like a choice. Um, she was born, you know, uh, when she was born, she was uh, at a certain age, she was put into foster care. And then from then on, she had no choice with for from that and then from that she was sent to the island of Avalon trained as a priestess uh, even the first time she had sex that was out of her control that was part of uh, what they called the Beltane rituals and um, so and then uh, some of her marriages later on but even her whole life everything none of it was really her choice she was like born into it and all a lot of her fate was chosen for her so she was almost like a pawn in this larger game of this pagan religion 
uh, trying to keep its foothold on uh, humanity and not get uh, pushed back into the mists of time by the oncoming rising new belief of Christianity. And that's the same thing with the uh, uh, people on the Christian side of the book as well. It's uh, like a lot of people I found in the book like aren't in control of their own fate. They're almost enslaved to their ideologies, which I thought was interesting. And uh, they can't see anything else. Like they just basically give their whole lives up to whatever they believe in. And they never really live their life for their own. It's everything they do is for some greater purpose or some greater move on the chessboard. So th that's like really interesting about this book. Now, the other thing about this book, it is very long. It is uh, 870 uh, six pages uh, and also it's very densely written there is a lot of story that is going on in this book and it spans like a, a lifetime the, all the characters in the book the, the book completely spans their lifetimes so there's a lot of characters that come and go and there's a lot of events that's happening you know you have the war with the Saxons and then you have um, you know the, the squabbles and the battles with the kings uh, before uh, Arthur comes along and then, uh, then you have this uh, one guy who decides he's the Roman emperor, and that's another war that happens. And the other thing, there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of sex in this book too. There's a lot of people sleeping together because there's a lot of like uh, uh, people being manipulated with sex, or people being uh, married off for political reasons, or people bred to certain people to produce a certain offspring. Uh, that will then be heir to the throne and there's a lot of that so all the sex in the book it's all uh, I guess with a purpose it's either to uh, keep a bloodline pure or to manipulate someone or something like that so there's a lot of that in there and some of the characters it's, it's very similar to Dune some of the characters are you know you, you want to sympathize with them but then they do and you you are sympathetic through a certain part of the book but then they do something so horrific, it's it like you lose sympathy for them. You can't sympathize with them. The one character I was probably the most sympathetic for in the book was uh, the character of Kevin Harper. And he basically is uh, a Merlin. So Merlin in the book, it's like a title, like it's passed down. And so there's like two Merlins. Uh, there's the original Merlin, uh, Talesian, I think his name is. And then the, the one who takes the mantle from him is Kevin Harper. And Kevin Harper was... Uh, he's a really good harp player, very good singer, but physically he's very uh, unattractive because he was mutilated when he was young. So he's all like uh, hunched and broken up and uh, burned up and stuff like that. So he's not nice to look at at all. But uh, he is the most sympathetic character, I thought, in the story. And the least uh, sympathetic character that I really didn't like was uh, the character of Guinevere. Arthur's a wife. I just couldn't stand her through most of the book. I couldn't stand her. Uh, I did get more sympathetic towards her at the end of the book. And the other character that was I liked uh, was the main character Mor um, of Morgane, Arthur's sister. But then she even does some very underhanded things that kind of makes it hard to uh, root for her later on in the book. Uh, but then you kind of end up understanding why she did it. And um, it's so yeah, it's, it's a very characters are very complex in this book it's not like cut and dry who the good guys are and who the bad guys are so in that way it, it reminded me of dune as well so now i'm not a huge fantasy reader i haven't read a lot of fantasy i usually read uh, science fiction or horror but i have to say out of all the fantasy books i've read this one would probably make a top five for sure after reading it it's really well done really enjoyed it now, as I mentioned before, the book is long at uh, 876 pages, but when you're reading it, no, at no part do you feel like any of the chapters are filler. Like everything is so well written and everything is for the greater good of the story. Because I've read books that were, you know, six, 600 pages, 700 pages. And in a lot of those books, a lot of chapters, you could easily just chop out or skip over. They don't have to be there. It just feels like they're just padding the book out for some reason. But this never feels like that. It uh, Everything feels like it belongs there and nothing ever feels like, no scene, nothing in the book feels like filler. It's all, it all feels like it should be there and the book feels like it should be as long as it is. So now the Mists of Avalon, now the story is broken up actually into four books. 
So the first book is The Mistress of Magic. Uh, the second book is The Stag King and then The High Queen, I believe. And then the final book is The Prisoner in the Oak. Uh, so it is split up into four books. So if you wanted to read it that way, where you read one book, then took a break, you could do it. But uh, honestly, I'd suggest just reading the whole thing right through, right from cover to cover. Um, because there are a lot of characters and there's a lot of events going on. So if you try breaking the book up by, you know, reading one book, then taking a couple months in between to read the next one, I think you're going to lose out. You're going to, it's going to be harder to keep track of the story. I think this is one of these books. It was just meant to be read right from start, right to finish, uh, despite its length. So I'd have to say this is definitely one book you should read. There are certain books I think that you should read before you're di before you die, if you're an avid reader. Like Dune, I think, is one of them. Lord of the Rings is another one. And this is definitely another book. You should definitely read. This should be on your book, books that you have to read before you die, um, is this one. And if you want to get into the Legend of King Arthur and stuff like that, definitely check this one out. I think this is, uh, I know this is the only one I've read. So um, I'm going to read other ones later on in the future. But for right now, this one was fantastic and I really enjoyed it. So yes, definitely check this book out. So that's everything I have to say in this video. Let me know what you think in the comments section and I will see you at the next one. I'd like to say thank you to all of my subscribers. I appreciate you all in helping this channel grow. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Also, don't forget to hit the bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are uploaded. 